to our introduction. Well, I am very excited about today because to have um, Patrice Weber with us who, and I feel very privileged to call her both a colleague and a friend, although COVID has kind of put a damper in our travel reconnection plans, but, but, maybe, but maybe this Christmas. Um, Patrice is both an educator and a historian. She is currently the education programs manager of the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust but she spent a great deal of time in uh, public broadcasting, Georgia Public Broadcasting, um, a good stint with Apple, teaching before that. She and I met um, at Belfer at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2018. And I were, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her so she can introduce, say more about herself if she would like, and definitely tell us about what she's gonna show us today. Thanks, Patrice. I'm so glad you would do this for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kale. I'm, I'm very grateful that you invited me to do this. And I love talking about this subject. Um, it's just one of my real passions. And as Kale said, my name is Patrice Weaver, and I am the Director of Education with the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. The Commission is a secular, nonpartisan state agency that strives to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and promote public understanding of the history. So today we're going to look at an event that took place in the year 1937 in Nazi Germany. It was an art show called the Degenerate Art Exhibition. It opened in Munich and was then sent to 11 other cities in Germany and Austria. And I got interested in this topic when I was doing research for a presentation I did on art as resistance during the Holocaust. And one of the themes that came out of that presentation was the Nazi labeling of art they didn't think reflected their Aryan ideals as degenerate or the product of some sort of mental deficiency on the part of the artist. The Nazi regime was dedicated to controlling every aspect of German culture, including the economy, the military, labor, manufacturing, media, leisure, and education. Now to help set the context for this degenerate art exhibition, let me give you a little historic background. So after the armistice ended the First World War in 1918, Germany formed a new democratic government in the city of Weimar. Under the Weimar government of the 1920s, the country saw a renaissance that affected the cultural scenery in all of its aspects. During this time, Weimar Germany was one of the major hubs of modern art in Europe. It was also during this time that a new approach to art and design flourished at the Bauhaus School of Art, Design and Architecture. The school was founded by the architect Walter Gropius, in the city of Weimar in 1919. The school's mission was to unite fine arts like painting and sculpture with applied arts like industrial design or building design. In 1925, the school moved from Weimar to Dessau, Germany, where it remained until it moved to Berlin in 1932. And then it closed permanently in 1933 and most of the faculty left Germany. Um, Walter Gropius in particular was first, he first went to the United Kingdom and then was invited to come to the United States and was on the faculty of Harvard. And a lot, there are a lot of buildings that were designed by Gropius that are still being used today. So let's look at these photos for a minute. The photo on the right side, that's the original Bauhaus School building that was designed by Walter uh, Gropius in Dessau. The bottom left-hand corner photograph shows a class, an art class being taught by Vasily Kandinsky. And if you don't know Kandinsky, he was Russian by birth and was one of the great masters of modern art. He used pure, abst his pure abstract paintings used only color and form. Now, Kandinsky taught at the Bauhaus School for 11 years and was one of the leaders of the art movement that became known as German Expressionism. 
Now let's look at some iconic pieces of Bauhaus design. As we look at these examples, keep in mind that the unofficial motto of the design school was less is more. And we can certainly see how these pieces reflect that motto. Now starting in the upper left hand corner, this black leather chair and ottoman was created by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe for the German pavilion in the 1929 International Exhibition in Barcelona, Spain. This chair is still called the Barcelona chair and it is made of stainless steel and leather, and it became a classic of Bauhaus furniture design. It is still being manufactured today. The red chair in the picture just below it is called the Vasili chair, and it is made of tubular stainless steel with leather straps. This chair was designed by Marcel Brewer in 1925. The story goes that he was inspired by looking at a bicycle with its bent steel frame. He started experimenting with this technique and this chair was the result. And it's called the Vasily chair due to Vasily Kandinsky's admiration of it. And just as with the Barcelona chair, it is still being produced. Now look at the lamp in the middle. This is one of the most commercially successful objects to come out of the Bauhaus school. It is the best-selling bedside table that was designed by Marianne Brandt. And Brandt was an artist and industrial designer who was the head of the metal workshop at the Bauhaus School from 1925 until it closed in 1933. She created this lamp in 1928. Now, chances are you have either owned a lamp like this or have seen one. These lamps are commonly referred to as gooseneck lamps because of the flexible stainless steel tube that allows the bin to hold its shape when you position the light. Brandt's original design is still in production and you can order a replica based on those original design plans from a company in Austria. Now the teapot that's in the far right, upper right, uh, that piece was also designed by Brandt and it's simply called tea infuser. It's made of nickel silver and ebony, and I personally love its sleek, clean lines. And finally, in the lower right, we see a painting by Kandinsky. This was done in 1926. It's titled Several Circles. And in this painting, the artist limited himself to only one form, the circle. This canvas is currently hanging in the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York City, and you can go and see it. Now, while I could happily spend hours showing you and talking about Bauhaus-inspired design and artworks, I will have to save that for another presentation. But just know that the influence of this type of approach led to changes in popular culture all over Europe, but especially in Germany. It reached into music with jazz bands and cabaret performances becoming wildly popular. This expressionistic movement extended from painting and sculpture to architecture, literature, theater, dance, and cinema. So in this slide, we're looking at some examples of works that debuted during this period in Germany. And as I said earlier, the cultural scene in Weimar Germany was very different to the pre-war years. First of all, there was no more government censorship of the arts or the press. Large cities like Berlin became notorious for their decadence and excess. Now what we're looking at here on the left is a movie poster from The Blue Angel. It was directed by Josef von Sternberg and starred Marlena Dietrich. And this is the film that made both of them international stars. Um, both of them came to Hollywood after this and had successful careers in Hollywood. Now the plot briefly of the Blue Angel is a story of a respectable academic who falls for a promiscuous cabaret singer and loses everything. And if you're interested, you can watch the entire thing, the English version of it on YouTube by searching the Blue Angel by Art House Media. Now the picture in the middle is a still from the movie Metropolis. It was directed by Fritz Lang in 1927. 
Metropolis was one of the first full length science fiction films ever made and is considered a German expressionistic cinema masterpiece. Now, finally, on the right, we have a poster from the play The Three Penny Opera, written by Kurt Weil and Bertolt Brecht. The play offers a socialist critique of the capitalist world. It opened in Berlin in 1928 and was translated into no less than 18 languages and was performed more than 10,000 times on European stages. The play was brought to the United States and opened on Broadway on April 13, 1933, but closed after only 12 performances. American audiences just did not get it. Now, while the play was not considered a success, you may recognize a song from the play. Und der Heimisch, der hat Zähne, und sie trägt ihr im Gesicht. Und Mickey's, der hat ein Messer, doch das Messer sieht man nicht. I'm guessing you recognize that. Now this song was translated into English and became a jazz standard in the United States. Mac the Knife, right? You probably are more familiar with the Bobby Darren version that was recorded in 1959. I know my parents had that record and I remember listening to that as a pretty young kid, um, not, not so young that I didn't remember it. Now the Nazis at this time were growing in numbers throughout the 1920s considered, they considered the Weimar mores, mostly of American influence, as obscene and antithetical to traditional German values. This made Weimar culture, along with avant-garde art in all of its aspects, a threat in terms of both formal and intellectual expression. So this cultural golden age in Weimar Germany did not last long. Socioeconomic instability resulting from a weak government, disastrous economic policies, and the onset of the worldwide Great Depression laid the groundwork for the German Nazi party to flourish and grow. And what you're seeing in these pictures just shows how worthless German currency was in the 1920s. And I'm sure you've all you've all seen these. You know, hyperinflation was rampant, and the Weimar government's response to that was just to print more paper money and flood the flood the market with this useless useless currency. So as I said, the Nazi Party had been growing all through the 20s and into the 30s, and this election poster is from 1932. Uh, the English translation of what that says is, "Our last hope, Hitler." Now, winning just 33% of the votes cast, which was still more than any other party, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany in January of 1933. Immediately, things changed. In September of 1933, Josef Goebbels, who was already the Reich Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, was also put in charge of the Reich Culture Chamber whose members, all Nazi party supporters, were the only ones allowed to be productive in German cultural life. Interestingly, Goebbels initially thought that German expressionism should be accepted in the new Germany and that it should be celebrated. He had a number of pieces of German expressionism in his personal art collection. His boss, however, had different ideas. Now, you probably know that Hitler had been a struggling artist in Austria before World War I. The realistic paintings of buildings and landscape that he preferred had been dismissed by the art establishment of the time in favor of more abstract and modern styles. Let me share with you Hitler's thoughts on modern art. Anyone who sees and paints a sky green and a field blue ought to be sterilized or there's this gem. If you like or produce modern art, it means that you are either politically subversive 
or biologically inferior. Now, you have to wonder if Hitler's hatred for any kind of modern art was based at least in part to the rejection of his paintings by the art establishment of the time. So in light of Hitler's view on what was good and acceptable art, Goebbels quickly changed his mind and divested himself of the pieces in his personal collection that did not conform with Hitler's ideas on art. A campaign to align German politics, society, and culture with Nazi goals was begun. This process of Nazification was widespread. The effort became known as Gleichschaltung, which in German is uh, coordination or synchronization. This assault on modernism was manifested in numerous systemic and systematic cleansing actions. Artists and musicians were discharged from teaching positions. Museum directors that displayed modern art were dismissed. Books were burnt. Music, films, and plays censored and thousands of artworks were confiscated from public collections. This extensive purge targeted what the Nazis deemed in Artita Kunst or degenerate art. So art that was acceptable to the Nazis were works that conveyed the values of militarism, racial purity, heroism, and traditional German values. The only art that was to be created and exhibited was art whose exterior form embodied an inner racial ideal. Also, it had to be comprehensible to the average viewer. In a speech Hitler made in 1937, he said, works of art which cannot be understood in themselves but need some pretentious instruction book to justify their existence will never again find their way to the German people. So let's look at examples of, of what Hitler thought of as the ideal. On the left, we see a statue by Arno Brecker done in 1936 and it's called The Party. And it represents the spirit of the Nazi party. This classical style male figure was the metaphorical embodiment of health and strength, the Aryan ideal Ubermensch or Superman. Militarism and male dominance were prominent themes in Nazi art, as was family life, often depicting strictly defined gender roles. And as an example of that, you see on the right, a painting by Adolf Wessel. It's called Kallenberg Peasant Family, and it was done in 1939. And here we have a portrait of a seemingly idyllic Aryan family. The father appears behind the rest of the family, casting a somewhat detached but domineering eye over his brood. A grandmother knits, children play, and at the center, the mother comforts the youngest child. This is a clear vision of a patriarchy with women subordinated by the prevalent Kinder Kuka Kirka, the children kitchen church ideology of the Nazis. This was acceptable art. So now let's look at a couple of examples of this so-called degenerate art. On the left, we see a canvas by Paul Clay titled Black Columns in a Landscape, which he did in 1919. Now, 1933, Clay, who was a Swiss German, uh, he, and he, he was a very successful artist and taught in several German academies, including the Baja School. After the Nazis came to power, Clay was dismissed from his teaching position and he voluntarily exiled himself to Switzerland. In 1937, the Degenerate Art Exhibition showcase 17 of his works as prime examples of the corruption of art that German modernism represented. Now the photo on the right is of a little bronze statue by Kate Kolvis. And this small piece, which is only about 12 and a half by 10 and a half inches, is called Soldiers' Wives Waving Farewell. And it shows the anguish felt by women left behind when their men go off to war. 
And I think in this, in this little piece, Colwich has completely succeeded in producing an impressive representation of the emotional states such as insecurity, fear, and the pain of parting. Now, a little about Colwitz. She was the first woman to be elected to a full professorship at the Prussian Academy of Arts. She had two sons who fought for Germany during World War I. When her son Peter was killed in action, Colwitz started to move to more left-wing politics and anti-war activism. After the Nazis rose to power in 1933, she, along with so many other artists, was, was forced to resign her teaching position. She continued to publicly criticize Hitler and the Nazis and was arrested in 1936. She barely managed to avoid being sent to a concentration camp. During the art purges between 1933 and 1939, 31 of her works were confiscated from German museums. In 1938, Kolwitz's husband, Karl, who was a doctor, was banned for, from practicing medicine because of his political views. The couple rapidly descended into poverty. Now the family was dealt another blow when their grandson, who was also named Peter, was killed in action in Stalingrad in 1942. Kathy Kolwitz died of heart failure just before the end of the war in April of 45. This art was deemed unacceptable. So I told you that the topic of this, of this was the Degenerate Art Exhibition of 1937. And now we're finally going to get to that. But first, let's look at another exhibition that was going on. In 1937, this spectacular exhibition was held in Munich titled The Great Exhibition of German Art. It showcased leading examples of the improved Aryan art and sculpture. And it was housed in this purpose-built palatial new building, the House of German Art, with tall ceilings and doors, natural light, marble columns and marble floors. The artworks were shown in the best possible setting. And here we have a couple of photos of the interior of that museum. On the right, we see Hitler and his entourage viewing the exhibition. And notice the scale of this building with its high ceilings, skylights, pristine walls, and the use of opulent building materials. This, this building, by the way, is still being used today as a museum, an art museum in Munich. You can go tour it. Um, here are two pieces of work that were included in this inaugural exhibition. On the left, we see another Adolf Weissel painting called Young Farmers. And this painting really represents traditional German values and quite frankly, very sturdy German women. And on the right, we have a Ermann Otto Hoyer's canvas called In the Beginning Was the Word, 1937. Now, this shows a very mythologized version of Hitler and the Nazi party's rise. When I look at this, I think, is that really what it looked like in the basement of those Munich beer halls in the 1920s? I don't think so. Now, speaking of mythologizing, here we see Hubert Lanzinger's The Standard Bearer, which shows Hitler as a knight in shining armor, riding a horse, holding a swastika banner, blowing romantically in the background. Hitler here is presented as a superior human being the almost godlike personification of the leader and head of the National Socialist Party. Needless to say, Hitler loved this painting and authorized it to be reproduced in posters and postcards that were distributed all over the Reich. Now, interesting thing about this painting, during the final phases of the war, this painting, which is oil on wood, was damaged by an American soldier when he hacked at it with his bayonet. This is what it looks like today. Now this painting is one of almost 10,000 works of German military and Nazi propaganda art that the US Army seized after the war as part of the effort to denazify German society. This and 400 other Nazi era artworks are still considered so politically charged that they remain in the US Army's custody. 
So at the same time of that great exhibition of German art was taking place, just a few hundred yards away, there was another exhibition. This one was housed in the old Institute of Archaeology building that was built in 1885. This venue was chosen specifically because of its low ceilings and dark, narrow rooms. It was called in Artete Kunst, or Degenerate Art. In publicizing it, the German press fell right into line with the traditional Nazi view, announcing this, that this exhibition contained train loads of dirt. And you can see in the doorway, uh, the sign above the doorway, that it says, Eintritt frei, which in English is admittance free, but children were not allowed in in order to protect them from this degenerate art. So let's look at a couple of pictures to see what it looked like when people were touring this exhibit. Notice the picture of Hitler on the right and compare it with the one that we saw just a few minutes ago of him touring the marble halls of the Great German Art Exhibition. There he was walking reverently through the halls, his hat was off, he was not speaking with anyone. Here he's laughing, not even looking at the art, his hat remains on his head. And just as a side note, if you look to the right in the right hand corner, that painting that's hanging askew, that's a, a canvas by Kandinsky. <coughs> now the picture on the left is one of Goebbels touring this exhibit. And I can't help but wonder, as he's looking around, is he saying to himself, ah, threat, I used to have that one in my private collection. So in these two photos, you can really see how this so-called degenerate art was displayed. Many of the works were crowded together without frames, leaning in stacks on the floor and partially covered by derogatory slogans. The rooms are narrow and dark. Taken as a whole, the presentation gives the impression of chaos and disorder. Now the art was divided into different rooms by category. Art that was blasphemous, art by Jewish or communist artists, art that criticized German soldiers or the military, or art that offended the honor of German women or farmers. One room featured entirely abstract paintings and was labeled the insanity room. Now the idea of the exhibition was not just to mock modern art, but to encourage the viewers to see it as a symptom of an evil plot against the German bulk or people. The curators sent, went to some lengths to get the message across, even hiring actors to mingle with the crowds and loudly ridicule and criticize the exhibits. In all, there were 650 paintings, sculptures, prints, and books from the collection of 32 different museums across Germany. We know exactly which pieces were included because an inventory of the original exhibit survived the war and is now in the collection of the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Now the exhibition was in Munich from July to November and then it was sent as a traveling exhibit to 11 other cities in Germany and Austria. I wanna draw your attention to the photograph in the photograph on the left, uh, there's a portrait of a young woman that's on the floor kind of leaning against something else. And there's also a framed landscape on an easel on the right side of that picture. Do you see that? So what, what we were looking at there are these two paintings. The painting on the left was done by Amadeo Modigliani in Paris in 1919. It survived the war and is currently in a private collection. The landscape on the right was by Andre Duran. He was the co-founder along with Henri Matisse of Fauvism. This piece also survived and is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. MoMA's director had this to say about this canvas. Uh, the director's name is Alfred Barr, Jr. The Duran painting, far from being radical, is a severely disciplined landscape in a modern classical style derived from Cezanne. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at these and I don't see one aspect that is degenerate in either of these. 
And because of time constraints, I can only focus on a couple of artists whose work were included in the In Arte Kunst exhibition. First, let's look at some works by Otto Dix. Now, Dix was a veteran of World War I. He volunteered at the outbreak of the war in 1914 to go into the Imperial German Army. He served in a machine gun unit on the Western Front and took part in the Battle of the Somme. And in case you aren't familiar with World War I history, the Battle of the Somme was one of the largest battles of the war and among the bloodiest in all of human history. It is estimated that casualties from this battle alone topped 1 million, including some 300,000 dead. Dix earned the Iron Cross and reached the rank of Staff Sergeant before he was wounded and reassigned. He was profoundly affected by his war experiences and suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD for the rest of his life. Now here are some self-portraits that Dix painted between 1913 and 1915. Beginning on the far left, we see a self-portrait that he did when he was still a student. Very straightforward, if somewhat unflinching view of himself. The next picture was done after Dix had been in, had already joined the Imperial Army and was sent to the front. Quite a different view of himself compared to the one just a year earlier. Now the third picture really gets to me. Here we see how Dix must have seen himself as a soldier in the trenches in the self-titled self-portrait as a practice target. And finally, how he saw himself evolved from that innocent student to the god of war, Mars. No wonder he suffered from PTSD. Now, Dix survived the war and returned to his native Dresden, where he became a professor at the Dresden Academy of Arts. In this work by Dix, it's a triptych or a three panel painting that he completed in 1932 and it was first exhibited that autumn in the Berlin Academy of Arts. Now let's look at it a little closer. Looking at it from the left to the right, the left wing depicts a column of German soldiers marching away from the viewer through the fog of war towards the battle that's taking place in the central panel. The central scene shows a devastated urban landscape scattered with war paraphernalia and body parts. In this central panel, we see a skeletal figure floating above the scene, pointing to the right with a soldier in a gas mask below and the scarred legs of a soldier upended on the right side. Now the right wing shows several figures withdrawing from the fight. The dominant grayish figure helping a wounded comrade is a self-portrait of Dix in a composition very similar to a Descent from the Cross or Pieta painting in Christian art. Now at the base under the central panel, we see several soldiers lying next to each other, possibly sleeping under an awning or tarp, or perhaps they represent the dead in a tomb. I wanna show you the, and let you compare these two compositions. The one on the left, is a 16th century piece called the Eisenheim Altarpiece done by Matthias Grunwald. And on the right, you see Dix's work. And you can clearly see how Dix took inspiration from the late medieval, early Renaissance religious paintings for his composition. Now going, going back to this painting, this painting created quite a stir because of the anti-war subject matter and after the Nazis came to full power in January of 33, Dix wisely retrieved the painting from the Berlin Academy of Arts and hid it. It survived the war and now hangs in the new master's gallery in Dresden. So in 1918, First World War was over and maimed veterans were a common sight on the streets of Germany. Dix would have seen these men, his former comrades in arms everywhere. Now let's look at a very different type of painting by Otto Dix that was included in the Degenerate Art Exhibition. 
This piece is called Kriegskrupel or War Cripples, and it was done in 1920. In the Degenerate Art Exhibition, this canvas was one of the works in the room that held art that was critical to the German military. And this piece shows a procession of cartoonesque yet morbid war veterans, painfully moving forward with the aid of push chairs, prosthetic legs and crutches, smoking cheerfully, although one soldier's face is half gone. In the exhibit, this painting was captioned slander against the German heroes of the World War. And in this painting, Dix leaves no one unscathed. He damns the military for butchering his generation, the public for its fascination with these reconstituted men and the cripples themselves for their undiminished national pride, still wearing their uniforms and medals. And again, I wanna go back to this picture of the, the veterans on the streets of Berlin or other German cities. So at the end of the Degenerate Art Exhibition's run, this piece and hundreds of others were destroyed. The image that we're looking at right now is a colorized version based on black and white photographs and the original sketches and that the artist did. Now, Dix also did a series of dry point etchings on this same theme, and one of these is in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Now, please note the irony of this parade of crippled legless veterans going past a boot maker shop. You see the boot hanging in the window and the, the hand pointing to it. And when the Nazis came to power, Dix, along with so many others, was fired from his post as art professor at the Dresden Academy. If he wanted to continue working as an artist, he would have to join the government's Reich Chamber of Fine Arts. Membership was mandatory for all artists if they wanted to exhibit their work. And Dix had to promise to paint only inoffensive landscapes. So in 1939, he was arrested on a trumped up charge of being involved in a plot against Hitler. But luckily for him, the charges were dropped and he was released. And towards the end of World War II, Dix, now in his mid fifties, was conscripted into the Volksstrom or the People's Militia. He was captured by French troops and was held in a prisoner of war camp until February of 1946. Eventually, Dix was able to return to Dresden and had a long and very successful career as an artist, gaining recognition and acclaim as a pivotal figure in the new objectivity movement in Germany. Now, here's an interesting side note about Dix's paintings. In the year 2012, a number of his canvases and etchings were found in a stash of over 1,400 works of art that had been hidden away by one Cornelius Gerlitt in Munich. Gerlitt was the son of the prominent Munich art dealer and sometimes personal art dealer to Hitler, Hildebrand Gerlitt. I don't know if you remember reading about that in the news in 2012. So the last artist that I want to share with you is Alfreda Losha Wessler. And I apologize if I'm butchering the German, not, not my strong suit. Um, her story draws into focus the horrific consequences of the worldview that lay at the heart of the Nazi denigration of modern art and their comparison of it with mental illness. Losha Wessler was a colleague and friend of Otto Dix in Dresden. She was a successful working artist with several exhibitions of her work during the 1920s. In 1929, after a disastrous marriage, uh, she suffered a nervous breakdown and was admitted to a psychiatric hospital where she continued to make drawings and to paint watercolors, many of them depicting her fellow patients. After two months, she returned to her parents' house, but in 1931, she had sort of a relapse and her father committed her to another psychiatric institution where she was diagnosed as schizophrenic. After the Nazis came to power in 1933, 
she was labeled a producer of degenerate art, and much of her work was confiscated or destroyed. In 1935, the National Socialist Law of Congenital Health led to her forced sterilization. And you may be familiar with the T4 program, the euthanasia program that, that the Nazis really started in 1937. And that was really a, an effort to systematically murder the mental and mentally and physically disabled throughout the Reich. Um, they, they used the excuse that they were ridding the country of the financial burden of these so-called useless eaters. As a result of that, Alfreda Losha Wolf Vossler was gassed to death in the Sonnenstein Euthanasia Center in July of 1940. Now here's a page from the Inarchita Kunst inventory that was found after the war and is now at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. I've enlarged the listing of the Losha Vossler's works that were in that exhibition. I, use, I put this in here today as a reminder that, and just to let you know, I do a lot of research in archives. And this, her story is far from unique, and it really serves as a powerful reminder of the painful human realities hidden within the pages of bureaucratic documents. I always try to remember when I'm looking through these archives that each name on these black and white lists was a living person. This was someone's son or daughter, a mother or father, a friend, a neighbor. We can never lose sight of that fact as we look at the sometimes mind numbing lists of names in these archives. So as I said earlier, there was an extensive purge of artworks from German museums between 1933 and 1939. Over 21,000 art objects were removed from German state collections including works by Marc Chagall, Henri Matisse, Pablo Picasso, Vincent van Gogh, Paul Klee, Edvard Munch, and many, many others. The majority of those works were destroyed, while others, those considered marketable, were sold abroad to raise funds for the Nazi regime. At the end of four months, the Degenerate Art Exhibition had attracted over 2 million visitors, nearly three and a half times the number that visited the nearby Great German Art Exhibition. Now I have to wonder how many of those people came to mock these degenerate artworks and how many came to admire them? It's impossible to tell. As you know, in Hitler's Germany, dissenters usually ended up in concentration camps. Either way, degenerate art had proved too popular. The Great German Art Show was restaged every year right up until 1945. The degenerate art show, oh, I froze. There I am. The degenerate art show was never repeated. As soon as the exhibition closed, the Nazis destroyed most of these modernist masterpieces. So the Nazis' goal of the Degenerate Art Exhibition was to reveal the philosophical, political, racial, and moral goals and intentions behind the modern art movement as they saw it. They saw this as a driving force of corruption, which followed it into society. Works were included if they were abstract or expressionistic, and also if they were works by Jewish or communist artists. I believe the Degenerate Art Exhibition was one of the most shameful chapters in of art history, but simultaneously one of the most surprising. Conceived by the Nazi regime to condemn modern art by showing its alleged perverse nature, it ironically became not only the ultimate backhanded compliment to the artists included in the show, but the most popular art show of all time. So thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. And if you would like to know more about the work of the commission, uh, you can find a link on our, 
our, our website, which is the holocaust.georgia.gov, there's a link to our YouTube channel where we put up the presentations that we do every month. And you can also visit our website to get more resources and information. If you have questions about today's program, feel free to email me. And there's my email address, Patrice Weaver at holocaust.georgia.gov. And I want to thank you very much for allowing me to be with you today. Oh, thank you so much, Patrice. Do you have some time to stay with us for a little bit to have some questions and, and conversation I now? I oh, do. Good. Good, because I have thoughts, but I'm sure oh, no, not that. <laughs> other people do too. But I was wondering if you would mind stop screen sharing so we can kind of all see each other in our Hollywood squares. I can. You know. Did it go away? Yep. Yeah, nope. We're right there. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. we have a, yep. We have a nice intimate group. I, I failed to say in the introduction that, that you all in Georgia are undergoing a storm right now and that the internet may be sketchy, but it was just that one time that you froze just for a second. I can't get off screen share. I'm so sorry. No, you are off screen share. Oh, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Maybe oh. you just need to put us in gallery view now. Thank you, Kale. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, by the time, yeah, by the time the Zoom world is over and something new comes, I'm going to know exactly what I'm doing on Zoom. Oh and my gosh. I'll, and then I'll have to learn something else. Which here's, the, here's the scary part. I'm the technology expert at the commission. So <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know, but you're way better than I am. I would love to open this up for questions and comments. We have a nice intimate group today um, before I start talking because everybody knows what happens when that begins. And feel free to also put it in the chat. Um, oh, Linda did put something in the chat. Wonderful presentation. What are your views on the Texas law regarding opposing views? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, here, here's an interesting, just a side note. I'm, I'm a sixth generation Texan. I have a huge extended family and a lot of them are educators. They're either currently in the classroom or they're recently retired or they're administrators. Um, we talk about this all the time. And, you know, the whole the whole idea that there is another point of view about the Holocaust is chilling to me. But yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Did you uh, did you happen to see there was an article in the forward yesterday written by a person who said, here's what happens with the opposite with showing the opposite view gave an example. No, I haven't seen that. It was in the forward. Yeah, I gave an example. It's called um, let me see it. I, I was taught the opposing perspective of the Holocaust in middle school. I'll never forget it. It's by Elliot Friedland. Okay, I'll look at that. In the 19th and the 40th. It's just very interesting, just what the giving the example of what happens when the opposite view is, or when the op is shown and the damage that it can cool. be. Thanks for well, that. Well, and, and hopefully um, there will be enough people who realize the um, insanity of, of that opposing view that will help us bring up some conversations about opposing views of other controversial, and I'm holding up air quotes, controversial topics. Because um, I, I was thinking about that a lot, Linda, as we were talking about the censorship, uh, as Patrice was talking about the book burning and the censorship of the art and the ideas, because, if it feels very much like that, this law, it has lots of nines and threes in it, and I can never remember the four numbers in order, but just this idea of what can and cannot be um, discussed. Yeah. Now, another, another thing I just wanna say, I represent a state agency, a secular nonpartisan state agency. So I have to always be cognizant of my personal political views and beliefs and keep that tempered, let's just say. So there you go. <laughs> as, as, as we do, as we, yes, as we do. Scott, did you raise your hand on purpose? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I just, uh, when you were saying about those who went to see the exhibit for, maybe they were actually interested and in those who were maybe opposed and wanted to see, has there been any research as to whether no. people, what well, numbers or, or how, how the how, how the populace in Nazi Germany saw this yeah, view it, on art? As you know, it's, it's very difficult to 
happened to the mind of people at that time. Uh, one, nobody spoke about it. Nobody published about it. If you did that, or I mean, you couldn't do it in Germany, period. There were some people from outside of Germany that were there as tourists and, and toured it. In fact, there's one piece, if you go on the USHMM website, there's a piece of video that was taken by an American tourist who walked through. Now, he doesn't really talk about what other people were thinking, just about what he was thinking as he viewed this. But I would, I would suggest that you look at the ushmm.org site and just Google the uh, Inarjo Tafoon's or Degenerate Art Exhibition and you'll, you'll see quite a lot of information there. One of the things I was thinking as I was looking at the acceptable art, especially the portraits, is how unhappy everyone looked in those <laughs> portraits. And I kept thinking, oh, this is the model family. They could have at least had them smile a little bit, but they all look very stern, very serious, um, not terribly happy. But, but one of the things you said that really intrigued me was that you know, one of the mandates of acceptable German art was that everyone, it could be understood by everyone with little effort. Right. Well, and I thought yeah. that was so telling. And that's also a real interesting comparison to the anti-intellectualism of today's political scene. So, you know, I try to, I try to point these things out and let people draw their own conclusions. Make their, make their connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that ranked right up there with inoffensive landscapes. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a real, I'm not a real artist, right? I, I'm a musician and I, I draw and paint and I'll do all that stuff, but it kills me to think that you tell an artist what they can and can't do, what they can and can't produce as an extension of their heart and soul. We just pause for a minute and and just reflect on that comment. I'm not a real artist. I'm just I'm just a musician and I paint and what did well, you say? And I paint and yeah. sketch. Yeah, I think that yeah, let me, let I think that say, classifies as a real artist. I don't make my living as an artist. I make my living as a historian and an educator. So okay, fair go. enough. But if you if you do three artistic things and, <laughs> and you do them routinely, I think that classifies you as an artist uh, for sure. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that we have here is an exhibit, um, of the Z clay prints of the true wartime escape of Margaret and H.A. Ray. And, and then I know from that, that Margaret Ray went to Bauhaus and studied there before yeah, it was absolutely. shut down. If you start looking at Bauhaus and the, the depth of their influence and reach that they had across all kinds of cultures and countries and different aspects of art, artistic expression. It's astonishing to me. And in such a short time, I didn't realize that it was around for such a short time. And it's really interesting to see what happened to the people who were part of that faculty and where they ended up. And, you know, thankfully a lot of them were able to get out. So, yeah. Well, I'm just going to keep talking if somebody I'm watching though to see if anybody takes themselves off mute but I should you know once KL starts with all the, the thoughts and I'm thinking about those 21,000 pieces of work and you said that the marketable ones were sold right and are those you know is there a list of those somewhere did they come back yeah what happened you, know, to them you, after? Can, you can trace you can trace what happened to them because they were sold through Sw mostly Swiss auction houses mm. and you know they have rec the records are there um the ones that we don't have we don't have a really comprehensive inventory of all of the pieces that were confiscated and destroyed we know oh. for sure the ones that were in the in Arthur de Kunst ex exhibition because that one inventory was found and that's the one that I looked at that's from the Victoria and Albert Museum and again, you know, when you look at that, you always have to remind yourself, these names, these lists, these are real people. What happened to these people? And yes, and just what, that we absolutely cannot ever qualify or quantify what was lost no. and who was lost. Yeah. No, it's just like when, when 
a student asked me, well, how do you know how many people were actually killed in the Holocaust? It's like, okay. Then you get into this whole, you know, statistical analysis of demographic history and how populations were estimated at the time. And then they were estimated again at the end of the war and extrapolated out natural deaths and births and all that. I mean, that, that's a whole area of, of historic research that you can spend your entire life working in. Right, and get sucked into all of those numbers um, and lose track of the fact that they were all people with lives people. and loves and... Yeah, my graduate studies are in demographic history. So I look at statistical analysis of the movement of migration and migrations of populations. So that's that's what I did. I did not, I did not know that about you. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a real nerd. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is why we were absolutely drawn to each other in DC. Absolutely. Except I'm curious about everything except numbers. Any Anything but statistics. Numbers make my head. I mean, I can I can do a checkbook. That's about it. But. And see, I, I believe and I taught that numbers are the basis of literally everything. There's not one thing that you, I can't relate to math. So there you go. And I am, and I am, I uh, have been persuaded in the last couple of years, indeed, um, that they don't lie. Yep, they don't the lie. Interpretations can take different paths, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to give a special okay. shout out to Agnes. Hi, Agnes. Oh, she's on the phone. Of course, I waited till she got on the phone. Uh, yeah, anyone? there was a comment in the chat that just said the Nazis oh. kept excellent records, and that's absolutely true. Um, but even at that, there was there was a lot that was destroyed at the end of the war. There were where well, there was a mass attempt to destroy evidence and to burn it and to bury it, and you know they weren't successful in doing all that because, for example, they took uh, they made copies in triplicate and sent them to different places. So I, I give you a little anecdote. I recently did a, re a research, a research to family that's living here in Atlanta, uh, the survivor, a survivor story. And this gentleman had been on one of the transports out of Belgium headed for Auschwitz. And it was the only transport that was actually stopped by partisans and interrupted. And he was able to escape that train. And, you know, he, he got off and escaped and made his way back to, to Antwerp and reconnected with his wife who was in hiding and survived the war and then came to the United States and had a family here and his wow. descendants live in Atlanta. Um, but my whole point was the records, this is the book about that, that event and that'll be on another presentation that I'm gonna be doing soon. Uh, but in this, when she wrote this book, the list of names hadn't been unearthed. So we didn't have concrete evidence that this man was actually on that train, that he was one of the, the people in those cattle cars. But then a copy of the original list that had been sent to a center in Northwest Germany was discovered and translated and put into an archive. And there he was on this list. It was like, I'll tell you, you can unearth this stuff. And that's the exciting thing about being a, a historian is that there's so much to discover and learn. Well, and you're given a great plug for that because this is the, we, you know, the George Santayana quote is, goes around all the time. If we do not learn from our history, we will repeat it. But if we don't have our history, if we don't have access to those documents, um, to those things, you know, because we were earlier talking about the opposing view law in in Texas and this idea of uh, Holocaust distortion um, that we're fighting so hard against right now. Um, but that is not the only history that is distorted, right? right? So having these archives, having these things and having your presentations um, are really valuable. So maybe you'll come back and do this for us again. Of course. And I, I will tell you that here in this state right now, we have six separate bills going into legislative action that deal with teaching of critical race theory, CRT, which that's a whole nother subject. But six different ones are, are going through the system right now. 
So we have to be vigilant. We have to be communicating with our legislators all the time. Because it is all connected, as we see in Texas. That bill was put forth because of critical race theory, and now we're talking about opposing views of the Holocaust. It is all connected. And with that in mind, and within history and research and exactly what you're saying, this is a great segue into next month when Beth Dotan, the founder of the Institute for Holocaust Education, will be speaking on the 18th of November on the work she's doing with her for her dissertation. And it's uh, the Nebraska Holocaust survivor and World War II liberator stories through the lens of digital humanities. And um, if you have not heard Beth speak at all about this, I really encourage you. Kale and I were able to hear her on a national on the national stage last week in a presentation, but it's exactly what you're talking about digging and as Kale would say, going down the rabbit hole and uh, just more and more information, but also having the ability to get that information out there. And so that people learn from what is factual as opposed to what is uh, opinionated or nonfiction, let's say. Yep, and make it all accessible, right? So we can see that ourselves. So thank you so much for joining us today, Patrice. I really appreciate it. And it's so good to see you. Um, you. Now I'll give a shout out to Agnes because she's off the phone. Um, Agnes is coming to us from Skokie, Illinois, and has been doing um, a lot of our survivor speaking engagements for us this fall and last spring and over the summer. So thank you very much. Um, and in the future. And in the future. Yes, absolutely. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of the week and we hope to see you on November 18th with Beth. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank you.